here. Well, Dr. Reed of George W. Truitt Seminary at Baylor University, professor of Christian scriptures, owner of many books, resident of Waco, and thoughtful student of the Psalms, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're here to talk about Psalm 99. As you know, we continue to go through the Psalms, which to a listener who didn't know what we were doing would think we'd sort of pick them randomly out of a hat. We're jumping around. We're not going in the order in which they're in the text, but this is the order that is in the lectionary. So if you're watching this Sunday School with us, you know that we just read this or sang this Psalm in Worship Sunday, and you may have thought deeply about it, not thought about it at all, but Either way, we want to dig more deeply into it and give an idea of what it means and, and as we learn more about the Psalms. And so uh, we'll talk about the lectionary stuff at the end, but as we begin, um, I want to read it for our class. Anything that you want to say, Dr. Reed, about reading uh, before I read it, as they, they should keep in mind as I... As I no, you're going you're to read it so well that they're going to pay <laughs> attention, and that's All the right. important thing. We're gonna hit it fresh and I'm gonna bring it up here. Okay, so this is the Psalm as it is found in uh, the Book of Common Prayer, Psalm 99. And as always, it gives a title for the Psalm, which is just usually the first word or two of the Psalm in Latin. So, Psalm 99. The Lord is King, let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. Here endeth the lesson. This is a, a powerful psalm and uh, being Psalm 99, it is the last of a section of Psalms that uh, recount the reign of God. Now, just to give you a little background about where we are in the book of Psalms, we're in book four of the Psalms. Book four of the Psalms begins with Psalm 90. I'm not going to re rehearse all of Psalm 90 through 98, so don't worry about that. Um, but the superscription for Psalm 90 is a Psalm of Moses. One of the things that that sets up is Psalm 89 is really a Psalm about the end of the Davidic monarchy. And so by the time you get to Psalm 90, you're saying, where do we begin? Since the so, and just for our listeners uh, and watchers, the Davidic monarchy, this is David being king, but also then his son Solomon taking over after him and his heirs. So it's sort of the, the end of the line for David. And then, and, and of course, many of the Psalms are attributed to David and a uh, great singer songwriter. And then we pick up now with where do we go from here? And superscription, as you said, is that little thing that's written above the some of the Psalms that say, this is the Psalm of David or Psalm of Moses or something like that. And are those actually, is that part of the Hebrew text? That's part of the Hebrew text. Okay. And in fact, one of the ways the Hebrew text is different from uh, the English text 
is in the Hebrew text, those have a verse number, and in the English text, they do not. Interesting. Why is that? Uh, because those are usually secondary to the text. Okay. Uh, right. And so in English, they, those would just be labeled headings. Okay. In Hebrew, they get they get a number like every other number. Partly because, it, and here I digress, but it's a it's a good digression. Um, one of the things that gave us the Hebrew text that we use was a group called the Masoretes <clears throat> in about 600. The Masoretes were worried that all sorts of strange biblical interpretation was taking place and they wanted to make sure that they nailed down everything in terms of the biblical text. And so one of the things they did is they wanted to make sure that all the chapters and verses were done correctly. And at the end of every book, there is an inventory um, of how many words, how many chapters, how many letters. And so my guess is part of what happens with the superscriptions is if they weren't given a verse number, then they wouldn't know where to put them in the inventory. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons why in the Hebrew you have verse numbers for the superscriptions or headings. And in English, uh, most English writers are not all that concerned about that level of inventory, and so they just let it go. And so that's why if you're talking to your Jewish friend about your favorite Psalms, and you say, I love such and such verse, their number might be different from the number of the Psalm, the verse number in your English Bible. Absolutely. Hmm. See, I didn't know that. I learned something new today. Yeah. All right, so thank you for that digression. And so now, as you were saying, we turn to Psalm 99, and it tells us it's a Psalm of Moses at the beginning. If you go back to Psalm 90, it says that's a Psalm of Moses because it's yeah. beginning this new section. And so, so that's we, where I interrupted yeah. you. Yeah, and, that, and that's really where we are. And so a number of the commentators are going to say, this has a sort of Moses feel to it. Now, the first word of, um, of the psalm is the Lord is king. Now, this is a, a, a fine English translation, but English and Hebrew work differently. The Hebrew here is going to be Yahweh Melech, uh, which means the Lord reigns. But Hebrew has an interesting uh, opportunity that you don't get in English. The perfect verb conveys to you completed action from the perspective of the writer, whether it is past, present, or future tense. And so when you have the term Yahweh Melech, then the question is, is this future, present or past tense. Now, this is always, in class, I, I, I always use this as an example of uh, the Cal Perfect, because I, I say to people, the English translation is, the Lord is king. And they all, it, it's true, we have really good and pious students say none. Yes, yes, the Lord is king. And I say, does that mean that the Lord wasn't king before? They said, oh, no, no, the Lord was king too. And I said, does that mean that the Lord will not be king in the future? They said, oh, no, Dr. Reed, the Lord will be king. Part of what the writer is doing is using a verb construction that wants to affirm the sovereignty of God in the past, in the present, and in the future. And so that sometimes gets a little lost in the English translation. And one little digression that I want to make here is that if you know uh, Melech, uh, those three consonants in Hebrew, sort of, to put it in English, MLK, um, you know then the roots of Melchizedek, 
you know, the root of Malachi. It's just, it, you, you begin to see, if you listen for those sounds, you hear them a lot and you begin to know this is about a king or about reigning or things like that. And um, just a little, it's, a, it's like a little insight into how often these themes appear in the scripture, in people's names. Yes. Part of what you're getting in 99 is the theme that God rules. One of the things in Psalm scholarship that we think is going on is Psalm 89 describes the sort of end of the world as they knew it. And in Psalm 90 through 99, they're saying that God continues to reign despite the trauma of the end of the nation as they knew it. And so this is a, a, a Yahweh Melech Psalm but you had one in 47, then in 93 through 99, you're going to keep getting the phrase, the Lord reigns. Hmm. Now the structure of uh, this Psalm is, I don't want to say tricky, uh, but there is no consensus among biblical scholars of the nature of the structure of the Psalm. Now, you might ask, why do we care? If you're reading a poem, you want to know what are the constituent parts of the poem so that you can see the ways in which those constituent parts help set up the rhythm and the flow and the structure of the song. So I like to think of this as having three parts. The first part is testimony and exhortation. Um, but even in the testimony and exhortation, which takes us really from verses one to verses five, the writer does an interesting thing here. The writer is going to use a phrase, God is holy, that's going to show up in verse three and in verse five. And so the Lord is king. Then God is holy, then God is holy again. And that gives a nice sort of structure to the early part. Then you have in six through eight, a reflection on the ancestors and how God interacted with the ancestors. This is gonna set up the conclusion of the Psalm, which once again brings us back to an exhortation Proclaim the greatness of the Lord, our God. And ends with the same line that we had seen in three and five. God is the Holy One. And so you can see just how well put together this psalm is. Now with those structural things in mind, let's sort of walk through, walk through the psalm. The psalm has strong parallelism. And once again, you're probably saying, why do we care? Because there are certain things that the poetry does, and you can see them more effectively once you know why it's going to have the repetition. Um, the Lord is king. OK, that's your first affirmation in line one and line two. Therefore, let the people tremble. Then it goes on that God is enthroned upon the cherubim. And so the line after that calls for a cosmic or earthly response. Let the earth shake. As Aaron already pointed out, he already gestured to the parallelism, the shaking of the people and the shaking of the world. Both of those are provoked by the sovereignty of God. First in the reigning metaphor, and then in the metaphor of enthroned on the cherubim. Enthroned is a, is a, nice, uh, a nice phrase, and I want you to think about as you were growing up, was there a certain chair 
that your father or mother sat in and you knew that was their chair? Well, more my grandparents. Every weekend we go to their house and they both had side-by-side -side lazy boy recliners mm -hmm. on which they would sit while we watched Golden Girls. And yes. there was one that was grandpa's and one that was grandma's and nobody else sat in those chairs. Yes. When we talk about enthroned, the, the Hebrew here is very simple, sad. But when you're sitting in your own space, your own lazy boy, in your own room, then you start to see some of the power dynamics that are enmeshed in that enthroned. Then it says upon the cherubim. Hmm. Now cherubim uh, are probably references to um, a sort of hybrid animal that included wings and I think it's part lion and part bird and is there to protect the Ark of the Covenant. And so you can almost see a picture of God sitting and using the cherubim as a footstool. The cherubim not only have this sort of frightful figure, but also are protecting and so the cherubim provoke the same sort of tottering in the earth, due, probably due to fear or awe that, you, that the presence of God did in the first line of the poem. Hence, the, the two, the, the four lines really go well together. And Steve, so, if I could just show one artist's picture, which shows kind of I mean, again, these are drawings that are trying to draw the undrawable, mm -hmm. but there's these beings. And if you've seen Indiana Jones and um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know that it depicts, sometimes you'll see these beings with these wings sort of outstretched. I'll do it like this, kind of covering yeah. the ark. And, uh, but this shows these multi-headed animals. I mean, you can see a head like a man, a head like a lion, a head like a bird, a head like an ox, and that, uh, I mean, that comes from Ezekiel, right? And there's some divine being. And this is this image of God being, in th and as it says in the psalm, enthroned among the cherubim. So an, a, a Hebrew listener hearing the psalm, you know, we think enthroned among the cherubim. We've been taught to think of cherubs as these little chubby babies. But a, a, a person hearing this psalm, enthroned among the cherubim, is going to have a very different picture in their head of what that means. And it probably wouldn't be like this. This is a 1773 uh, drawing of what that would be like, but but it gets a little bit more, and, and a Hebrew person would never draw a human figure to represent God in the middle there, but nevertheless. That's right. Uh, it's their idea would have been this ineffably powerful divine being with the Ark of the Covenant as some sort of footstool and, he, and these divine beings that you can't even really describe with these wings and all that sort of stuff. So anyways, all that to, blow people's minds and just think a little bit differently about what you should be seeing mentally when you hear enthroned among the cherubim. Yes, enthroned among the cherubim should have you thinking of a combination of Incredible Hulk and Aquaman more than Baby Boss. Yes. Uh, and not Bruce Banner, but Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk. Um, so we have the reign of God but also the language uh, goes on and says, the Lord is great in Zion. We have other, uh, the Lord reigns Psalms, but this is the only one that connects the reign of God with the place of Zion. You have an interesting, once again, an interesting parallel. The Lord is great in Zion, God is high above all peoples. So on the one hand, you have the specificity of Zion, but you also have the universalism of all peoples. Mm -hmm. And so the writer here is trying to 
fuse those two testimonies together. Uh, you're going to get a number of references uh, of God judging from Zion. Uh, you're going to get that in Amos. You're going to get that um, in various places in the Psalms. And here is one of the places. However, this sets Psalm 99 uh, in a different way than the other uh, Psalms of uh, the Lord's reign. Then and, uh, one quick question here. So if this is the end of the Davidic monarchy, are we already in an in an exilic period or were they in exile yet or are they still in jerusalem because to look back to zion if you're in exile is like looking back home and uh and and this would be a statement more like we hope one day again the lord will be great in zion but isn't right now because the temple has been destroyed and we we're no longer there anymore so when do we know how this psalm relates to that historic event a great question, and you pointed to the scholarly debate. Some are going to argue that the reference to Zion indicates this is pre-exilic. Others are going to say uh, this is part of the redemption of Zion in a post-exilic setting. By the time you get the Psalms of Ascent, they will have references to Jerusalem and Zion but those references are meant to really sort of re-sacralize the place and to help folks understand that the specificity of God's reign and the universality of God's reign come together. And so you can reappropriate Zion in a way that you couldn't before. Mm. And because the exile is the time when folks were really sort of pushed out of the nation. For many of these folks, uh, the process of Passover and the process of a number of the key festivals would be a pilgrimage festival. Mm. And so now Zion is a specific place, but it's also uh, a location for pilgrimage uh, and the the pilgrimage in, in, a, in a really interesting way um, really helps dislodge uh, the monarchy as the model. And now you see God as the king in Zion who no longer has to share any billing with a Davidic king. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is probably a reappropriation of Zion in the post-exilic period uh, as, the, as the religious center hmm. of uh, not just uh, the Hebrew nation, but the entire world. And that's what you get in verse two, he's high above all peoples. And is the word there in Hebrew, the goyim? Is that all nations? Is that included? No, this is, this is uh, uh, um, okay. all peoples. So it's not, you're right, it would be nice if it were goyim, because then they would be expressly nations outside the faith. But here they use am, um, uh, but I think you're also going to get am um, a lot in, uh, in the later chapters of Isaiah and some of what you get in the enthronement psalms, um, which is another name for these types of psalms, you'll get in Isaiah 40 through 66 which will talk about God's universal reign. So, okay. uh, the Lord is in Zion. Um, now, I, since I've been in Texas, I always remind folks that Texans are real big in the particular places. Uh, Texans are about as committed to being Texans as people from any other part of the world. And so when we think about Zion, it's important for us to think about how while God is beyond space and time, we do locate our revelation of God in a particular space and time. And so part of what's going on here with Zion is they're trying to think of uh, the revelation 
mm -hmm. it comes through that place. Then in verse three, he gets a really nice, let them confess God's name, which is great and awesome. Now, the word confess, in Hebrew, this is a great, this is a great word because it means the confess word is the same as a praise word. And so when the community says that they will confess the name of God, they are confessing the belief in God and they are praising God simultaneously. Now, this is an easy, um, this is an easy, easy bridge for uh, liturgical traditions to cross because um, liturgical traditions understand the process of confessing and the process of praising are meant to go hand in hand. But often, uh, and in, in the Hebrew, that comes through pretty clearly, but in the English, a lot of folks would miss the fact that confession used here is also praise language used here and really should bring those two things together. Um, let's see here. And again, it's important for people to remember, you know, the Psalms were written, at least many of the Psalms, and I think this one was written not as a personal devotional reading, although it certainly could be that. But again, nobody had books. Very few, you know, this wasn't something you sat and read with your morning coffee like I do with morning prayer. It is was designed as a corporate worship uh, experience or something to be said by a community of people that were worshiping uh, together. It's a, it's a poem, it's a song made to be said together. And so I think that let them confess his holy name if you say that in a worship setting, I mean, that's that's has a very different feel. It's sort of almost like let us all remember who he is and confess his name and what we believe and and give glory to God. Yes. And that process of giving glory should not just be in your head. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons I want to sort of massage what we're doing with confess is often uh, we hear the word confess and we think something cognitive. And we forget that it's meant to be holistic. So that while there's a cognitive aspect, there's also an affective aspect. And there's also um, a behavioral aspect. And that segues into um, verse three, where it says, God is holy. Now here, it's going to be important to keep in mind that the psalmist wants to talk about the reign of God, but also the separateness of God. Mm -hmm. um, and so God reigns, but God is also separate. God is not just every day. Now, um, many of us, uh, once again, going back to the process of growing up, know what everyday food is. Um, I remember uh, in my house, broccoli was sort of everyday food. It, was, it wasn't special. It was green and we were required to have green every, every two or three days or so. Um, but then there were certain days that we would have a special treat and that would be set apart. And so when they say God is holy, they're meant to say, that God is separate, not just every day. And so the fact that the psalmist brings that in three times, mm -hmm. one in verse three, one in five, um, becomes a, a key element here that we'll want to pay attention to. You don't have turkey and cranberry and stuffing every, every month, every week, or every day. No, no. Uh, otherwise, we'd be asleep a lot more than we are now. <laughs> Um, let's move uh, to the reflections on the ancestors. This is a, a fascinating uh, passage. Oh, wait, uh, one more thing. Can I go back yeah. just a second, though? Yes. I mean, one thing that might be lost if you don't have that 
black and white picture that I showed earlier of God enthroned among the cherubim and how that's a connection to the ark where that holds the law of God and the holy bread and the, that all that like in verse five fall down before his footstool we should be picturing the ark again because again he's enthroned among the cherubim and the ark is kind of his footstool and so we should be picturing a king in his throne room surrounded by these divine attendants the ark is the footstool and we're doing the we're not worthy we're not worthy um and so, because you know for, again to modern ears the idea that god has a footstool it sounds very odd like is it some sort of ottoman used for storage to hide the remotes when the company comes over but it's <laughs> The, again in the hebrew imagination it's very specific footstool means ark of the covenant and this is the throne room of a king these are people worshiping and falling down in front of a king and they for but if you don't know that you just think it's weird god has a footstool we don't think of it but it, again it's a throne room so yeah it is a throne room and and to go back to uh, grandma and grandpa yes before there was uh, a lazy boy with an automatic recliner there was an ottoman yes and the ottoman functions like a, a footstool, a place to put the feet. Now you also see in iconography pictures of a seated deity with feet on the wings of the cherubim. And so that would be another way of, of thinking about it. These are support for the feet. Mm -hmm. And so I think your, your metaphor is a good one. Um, the Ark of the Covenant as the support for the feet is going to let you know the way in which the writer sees uh, the testimony of Scripture as foundational mm -hmm. uh, to the worship process, but also foundational to just sort of the nature of God's self-revelation. And, you know, if we can say one sort of other amazing thing for people they may not realize like that the ark of the covenant was in the temple and so when we talk about the holy of holies a lot of people think that the holy thing in the temple is the ark and yeah the ark is a holy thing but what that means is that that is the throne room of god and um which departs at the end of Ezekiel, and that's another big long story. But again, this is this is not a um, you know the, the question of where the ark is or was and all that sort of stuff. That's another big debate. But again, at least for a certain portion of Israel's history, this was a physical thing where they believed God dwelled. Which again is such a big deal about why it was such a big deal when they went into exile. God actually had like an address, a street address, and it was in the temple. And it was in the in the holy of holies, and the ark was there, and that was God's actual footstool. Yes, and it's just uh, again, and that specificity gave a certain level of order. And here in ninety nine, they're saying the temple may be destroyed, but God is still sitting on the throne, mm -hmm. and God is still rooted in the Word of God. And so even though this is an exilic, I think an exilic song, it becomes all the more radical because everything else has been taken away from, from this people group. Okay, well, thank you for letting me make that uh, digression again. Uh, I love these conversations and so, and it's a treat for me. So thank you for letting me uh, have this conversation with you. Now you were going to, you were moving into the ancestor section verses six through eight. Yes. Uh, the ancestor section, Moses and Aaron are among his priests. Now this is an interesting passage. Uh, part of what's going on here is, and, and as good Episcopalians, you'll remember Exodus three and Exodus six. Um, you get the call of Moses, and uh, at first Moses says, "Well, you know, you know, I, I didn't go to seminary. I didn't have a great preaching, preaching class. You know, I'm not sure I'm your, I'm your guy." And to which God responds, "I'm the person who created tongues, and if I want you to speak, you'll be able to speak." But Moses, Moses was 
was not not the best of uh, of seminarians and so he says oh well 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 at which point God relents and says I'll let you take Aaron Aaron becomes uh, one of the first priests but the line between Aaron and Moses is an odd one because Moses functions as a prophet and a priest simultaneously. That is to say, he is the bringer of the word, but he's the bringer of the word in a time when the word becomes really the elements of worship. And so he'll be talked about in this passage. And in fact, my guess is this passage would be one of the earliest statements that they're going to say, aha, Moses was a priest. Um, the book of Deuteronomy calls Moses the first prophet. Moses gets a lot of offices. Mm -hmm. And so we see Moses here. Um, and so Moses and Aaron are among uh, the priests and most Psalm scholars say, yay, we know this, we know this. And we get the pair of Moses and Aaron in other places and that's not, that doesn't throw us. What throws a number of folks is the next line, and Samuel among those who call upon God's name. They said, where did Samuel come from? Uh, this is one of the places where the Psalm is a little unusual. During this series, we've looked at a number of the historical Psalms, and you'll notice Moses and Aaron show up pretty consistently. We've not heard of Samuel in any of the historical Psalms. I think this is probably an oblique reference to 1 Samuel 3. I know you, you probably know what 1 Samuel 3 is, but for the folks who have forgotten, um, Samuel is a young a child sleeping um, before the Ark of the Covenant in the same, well, in a different room than Eli. And the passage in 1 Samuel 3 is an interesting one. It says, the word of the Lord was not frequent in those days. Yeah. And so um, God says to, to Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And so Samuel gets up, no one's around, goes in, uh, and says to Eli, I am here. A sleepy Eli says, oh, go back to sleep. Um, Samuel goes back um, and tries to fall asleep. And then again, Samuel, Samuel gets up, goes to Eli. Eli is still pretty sleepy, but he says, okay, this time when you hear the name, say your servant listens so samuel goes back god calls samuel again and this time samuel has the right answer your servant listens i think that experience of samuel as the listener in first samuel 3 is what's what's uh referred to here when samuel among those who call upon god's name um, I think this is call upon God's name is an active calling, but I would add, here's God's call as what sets up the calling God's name. And um, Samuel is going to be one of the first uh, prophet slash judges that you get. And so by bringing together Moses, Aaron, and Samuel, uh, the psalmist has brought out three sort of pioneers in the faith. And to the reader, let the reader understand, there's also a lot of time between Moses and Aaron and Samuel. And so um, if you're not familiar with the Bible, you might think these are like, you know, Huey, Louie, and Dewey, uh, Larry, Moe, and Curly, like three people that are around together at the same time, but not at all. They were Moses and Aaron brothers centuries before. And then Samuel, who's, you know, 
a more recent figure in Hebrew history at the end of the Davidic monarchy, since he was the one that uh, enthroned or sort of anointed Saul and then David as king. Yeah. And so by having, even though there are only three, by covering that much time, you get what I think the writer of Hebrews would call a cloud of witnesses. Yeah. That are, that are re referenced in only these three names. Um, they called upon the Lord and God answered them. Here the psalmist is gonna make this statement uh, in a couple of other places. One I think uh, is gonna be Psalm 22. But the thing is the psalmist wants to make clear that God has been responsive before, and therefore the psalmist is asking God to be responsive again. Hmm. Uh, so they called upon, and God answered. Notice the, the sort of parallelism, call and answer. Um, sometimes in church, you, the preacher will call, and even Episcopalians are supposed to answer. <laughs> Okay, um, so the call and God answered. God spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. This becomes one of the places where the testimony takes place. And you'll remember that the pillar of cloud is a theophany. That is to say, it is uh, an appearance of God. And so what they've done is they've fused the spoken word and the theophany together. Mm -hmm. So that out of that appearance, they get a sound. And so you'll sometimes hear, uh, I saw the word of the Lord, partly because it's still fusing the visual sense and the auditory sense as a response to the divine initiative. But notice in verse seven, the pillar of cloud, they kept the testimonies of God and the decree that God gave them. What we're gonna see in uh, the uh, lectionary is that the pillar of cloud or that testimony becomes the tablets which then gesture toward the witness of what God had done but also the decree of what the people should do in response. And so they kept both the testimonies, namely the narrative, and they kept the stipulations. Notice the verb which God gave them. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that uh, you have to overcome, we see uh, law as an, an imposition, but for that community, they saw Torah as an instruction, a strategy of how to live successfully. And in that regard, gift was part of what is going on there. Then in verse eight, you can see the, the shift. O oh Lord, our God, you answered them indeed. So you get the answer theme. Ah, but you are God who forgave them. Part of what's going on here is the theme of forgiveness. But it is not a Santa Claus forgiveness, yet punish them for their evil deeds. Once again, if you'll remember the historical Psalms, the historical Psalms will remind us of the events in the wilderness. And in those events in the wilderness, uh, the people were punished for uh, their murmuring against God and Moses. Uh, one commentator says, this is a, an interesting Psalm because on the one hand, God calls us to justice and equity. Uh, at the same time, God reminds us of God's willingness to forgive. So both things are at work here. Um, 
And so based on this, you get the final uh, exhortation or imperative. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God. Worship God. Ah, once again, we're coming back to Zion. But now it is not Zion, it is God's holy hill. And notice the parallels, the holy hill and the holy God. Mm -hmm. In some regards, this might cause us to go back to Psalm 2, that we'll talk about the holy hill and the holy God. Um, and so we come back to that process. I know we're starting to run low on time, so let me just say a word about how this uh, occurs in uh, the lectionary. This occurs in three different places in the lectionary. Uh, one of them is with uh, Psalm uh, 24, where Moses goes into the cloud. And you can see why they would connect this with that because of the word pillar of cloud. Um, and you have the giving of the Torah in the cloud. Another uh, time, in fact, uh, the Sunday we're recognizing today has this connected to Exodus 33 verses 12 through 23. Um, and here, Moses says, God, I really want to see you. Now, this is an interesting thing. I mean, I told you Moses was a, was an interesting seminary. So he, he asked some really sort of rigorous questions. And God, God sort of responds, eh, I'm not sure you know what you're asking for. Uh, but God puts him in the cleft and then discloses some of God's glory to him. Um, and so part of what uh, this psalm is doing is gesturing toward that self-revelation um, in Exodus 33. And so uh, the lectionary committee wants to put these two together. Now, uh, you also have uh, in the last Sunday of Epiphany in year C, which is not uh, this Sunday, um, but this is connected with uh, Exodus 34, 29 through 35. And that's the case when um, Moses and Aaron have had such an intense religious experience that they're just lit up, luminescence. And they have to put on a veil because the people just can't deal with the luminescence that's come out of their experience with God. You can see how that could also connect with this psalm. But as uh, Alton Brown says in Good Eats, that's another episode. So that's a, a quick look at Psalm 99. And for us who are reading it or have read it already, um, as we are looking at this, I hope getting some of the history of what's behind it, people that have um, arguably lost everything, their way of life and their place in the world, and yet they still look back and hope to what God has done, what God is currently doing, that he is still king, and that he, and that in the future, God will reign, that all that is there, and even this phrase, I think so important for us today in verse four, that God is seen as a lover of justice and that God is seen as one who has established equity and has executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. And those are things that were, those were aspirational statements then as they are now. Um, but God is still a God who loves justice and um, will establish equity, uh, we pray uh, in the world. And so I hope this is something that is helpful for people in their, um, as they think about how to pray to God, how to talk to God, how to think about God and, and seeing how people in the past did the same thing. Is there anything else you wanted to say as we wrap this up, Steve? Um, I think that that's a great observation. And a, a pandemic is a great time to, uh, to say that the Lord reigns mm -hmm. because there's many temptations to say, what, what is going on? Is there any order? 
and the Lord reigns is an orienting affirmation and confession. Uh, and so Psalm 99 can give us a place to stand when uh, COVID numbers might make us wonder, where are we? Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, that is a great way to end. Thank you again for your time and your insight. And we look forward uh, to speak with you again as we continue our series, Fire in the Night, as we look at the, at the Psalms. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you. See you next week.